like to uh, introduce my friend and fellow Olympian, Steve Cohen. This is the second in a series of discussions concerning the state of American judo with Steve. And I think particularly this session, he wants to talk about <clears throat> coaching and international coaching and some of the pluses and minuses and major deficiencies of our current system and perhaps give us some insight into how we could improve both at the local and national level, which would end up improving us at the international level. So with that, I'll introduce Mr. Steve Cohen. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I enjoy doing this for many reasons. One is I get a chance to talk to you. <laughs> I enjoy it too. Uh, <clears throat> thanks. Uh, you know, we are in a very unique situation today with judo. Uh, we, we are not a, a country that has an organization that communicates with its people. We're in a pandemic and we're competing with wrestling and BJJ and other jujitsu. And I don't even know really what BJJ is, but I know that it's out there and people that are marketing and fighting for every student. And we're pretty much not doing much of anything. And, uh, if we don't get it together quickly, we're going to find that when the pandemic's over, our small numbers are going to be smaller. And that's a reality. Uh, later in, the, in, in this talk, I'm going to get into what my views are on how and what we need to do uh, going forward. But first, let's talk about coaching, because I know we touched on it at the beginning of the last call. I did want to get into it. I did have a life as an elite coach working with the best athletes in the world. And, uh, and I, I can give you my views on that. Uh, <clears throat> one of my students, Hillary Wolf, who was a junior world champion, two-time Olympian, a tough, tough athlete, tough competitor. Uh, she was with me since she's like 10 years old and trained with us five days a week. We taught her, coached her every single tournament. And, uh, all the way up to Egypt at the Junior Worlds, and she took first place, which is no small, small thing. You know, beating the best girls in the world, it was quite an event for me. And as a personal coach and a team coach, uh, it was an incredible privilege to be there. Maybe five years later, I was asked to coach a team in Europe, and Hillary was on that team. She had gone to train at the training center in Colorado Springs, so I didn't have my hands on her training her and coaching her every day anymore. But still, I went there. And she's fighting in Austria against a girl named Amarella Savone from uh, Cuba, who's a marvelous judo player, just tremendous judo player. So I'm coaching Hillary. And again, I'm not spending much time with her, but I know Hillary for quite some time. And they go in the match, and, and Savone handles Hillary pretty good. And I look across at that coach, and I realize that Hillary and Savone have fought nine times and he's been there all nine times and this was my first time watching it boy was i underprepared boy did i i had no idea i didn't know what she did i didn't know how she did it and this guy knew every little thing about hillary at that point i realized the only way i could be a real coach a professional coach is to be at every single event be at every training camp every competition be involved like a professional would if you're a football coach, a hockey coach, a baseball manager, I mean, the, the time and effort to compete with the coaches that are paid to be a coach, a national coach, whether it's Cuba, whether it's China, Japan, I mean, that's the type of effort you had to put in. And I decided that when I was appointed the, uh, the, the Olympic coach position in 1996, that's what I decided I was going to do. And it took an enormous effort, you know, left my job. I had to raise maybe $30,000 a year myself so I could, I could self-fund to the competitions that weren't funded. There, there was quite a bit that I had to do to make sure I was at every competition and in every training camp and knew every athlete. And I did an enormous amount of, of background work at a time before YouTube and, 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 and the internet videos 
everything was on a, on, on a VHS tape. So there, there was an enormous amount of work to do. So when I decided I was going to do that, it was a big commitment. It was a commitment from my, my family, my wife, the people I worked with. And I decided I would do it with the understanding that when an athlete makes a commitment to make an Olympic team, and Jim, no one made a bigger commitment than you going to Japan with a one-way ticket. The, this is their life's dream. This is, this is their life's dream, their goal. This is what they live for. If I can't be as committed to this as they are, I can't be worth anything as a coach. That was my view. So as I evaluate my job and I evaluate coaching, I think about what's the most important thing. What is the most important thing? And I ask people and I talk to people and, you know, they say, well, preparation, knowledge, you know, that's not, it's neither of any of those. The most important thing when you're coaching an athlete is trust. Athlete must trust you. That trust must be built and continue to build throughout the whole relationship. When the athlete trusts the coach, there is a bond there that the coach doesn't sometimes doesn't have to do much other than be there because the athlete knows someone's got their back. And if you fought in competitions, Jim, where the coach didn't have your back, you know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? Yes, I do. I certainly do. So my, my, my first goal was to, to gain the trust of every athlete. And someone like Jimmy Pager, who I know since he's a baby, traveled with him and know his family. He didn't trust anybody when I, when I came out. And I knew him well. I had to build a trust with him over, over the first six months. And, 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 you know, as with Salida Schultz, as with Hillary again, which we knew, but Brian also, you have to build the trust. You build the trust many ways. First of all, you have to be there. You have to be there. They have to know that you're as committed as they are. You, you, you must make the effort to know the other athletes, know the other coaches, Know the other referees. This is not a, a trip you take where someone sends you a ticket and you go and you sit in a chair and you scream. You want to be a professional coach, you have to be a professional. You have to do the hard work. And that's what it takes. When, If I was at a competition after I had coached for a year, I could go to a coach from any other country and talk to them if I needed some information that wasn't too, you know, wasn't too much giving, but I have friends uh, from other countries and they, as with me, that if there was an athlete from another country that wasn't their country that, that, that I had to ask him about, I never saw this guy before. Yeah. He won this tournament or that tournament. You have a relationship with it. You have to have a relationship with the referees. You know, what's going on at this competition? What are they looking for? What do I have to be aware of? Does it matter? Yeah, it matters. It matters a lot when you're out there fighting. You know? So so those may be little things, but they're important things. The next thing you have to do is you have to know the competition. So what I did is, you may think it's extreme, but this is what I thought needed to be done. I had an evaluation of every single person in the division. For example, I'll use Jimmy for an example. Uh, I had a, a book a book about an inch and a half thick where I had every competition, every head to head competition, every result. And I had every athlete in his division and each athlete, we had a strategy. We knew how they played, what they did, how they played and what we had to do to beat them. Uh, we also had a list of, in Jimmy's case, of all the lefties that had fought them and beat them. So if I had to choose a competition, or a match to watch to prepare, uh, I would know what to do. And just for a quick example, in 1999, Jimmy drew the Mongolian in his division who beat him in the, in the previous Olympics. And, you know, Jimmy was, you know, a little concerned that he was in his division. So Christoph Gagliano, the guy who took second in the Olympics, beat the Mongolian. I had the videotape, and, and Christoph was a, was a lefty. I had the videotape of him beating the Mongolian and we were able to watch that tape and see what he did and, and, and know what Jimmy did wrong and what this guy did to beat him. And, and that's what you need at your fingertips if you're going to do the job. And did that make a difference? Yeah, it made a difference. He didn't fight him, 
you know, but he slept better that night, you know? So you, you have to be professional when it comes to this. Jason Morris came on the team the last year. He was out of the judo for three years. When he came on, I gave him a book and we had an, every athlete, we had a dossier on every player. So we could look and see what every player did, how they played, you know, and then we put together a strategic plan throughout the training camps of how he was going to play him. So th those are just some of the things, some of the things, you know, the athletes were committed. The coach has to be as committed. Okay. And you have to know every single athlete. If you remember at that time, you know, the, the, the seating was limited. You didn't know who you were going to fight. The teams were picked late, you know, so you had to prepare for 40 different people. So my strategic, my, my strategic papers were on 40 different athletes, you know, so it was, it was a lot of work, but I mean, you think that, you know, uh, co football coaches don't do that kind of work, baseball, man. I mean, that's what you have to do. If you want to, if you want to win, if you want to have a chance to win. So, I mean, that's, you know, th that that's where it starts. That's where it starts. You know, uh, it used to be that playing, you know, being able to coach a game day match meant something, but it doesn't mean anything anymore because you can't coach during the match. So all the coaching is done prior, you know. And I'll tell you a quick story. When Jimmy was in his world championship match with Makarov, you know, we pulled the book right before the match out of, out of, his, out of his bag and we read the plan to beat him. And sure enough, he did exactly what we thought he was going to do, and that was Jimmy's first score. So uh, did it matter? Yeah, I think so. I think so. So, you know, I did this myself, and it wasn't, you know, it, it, it was at a sacrifice. You know, I left my job. I left my family. I raised money. You know, when I was done, boy, was I tired. I was tired, you know. So, it's, it's, it's a commitment the, the if we want to be competitive, not with one player winning, with a team that's competitive, we need to get a coach with a staff that's going to be able to do the work and be there. The first thing you have to do if you're going to be a good coach is you have to show up. You have to show up. These guys that come on these trips, one off. I mean, as players, we look at it and we laugh. Who do we got this time? Who do we got this time? You know, and when someone says to you, listen, I think you should watch out for Uchimata. Are you kidding me? You know, are you kidding me? So it's, it's, you know, we need the coach that's committed, that earns the trust of the players and is there. He's got to be there and it makes a difference. You agree, Jim? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. It's very important. And uh, one of the things when I give clinics that I, try and uh, explain to younger players and players that aren't at the national or international level is that when their category comes up, they as a player need to not be sitting on the sideline or talking to a friend. They need to be paying full time and attention to every single match in their category. And so does their coach. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. But one of the things that I found over time is that as younger athletes get better and better and they travel, oftentimes they don't have a coach or a mentor or even someone to hand them a bottle of water. They're on their own. And I think it's a tragedy, but if they are taught at a very early age to concentrate on every single athlete, learn their names, learn their moves, watch what they do, see how they work, that's inculcated into them, and they, at the next tournament, if they have to compete against them, they have a knowledge base to deal with. But I don't hear many coaches talking like that or many judo teachers talking like that. And I haven't been to a tournament in a long time, but there were 
times when I would go to major tournaments and young athletes or children would be sitting on the sidelines chatting while their division was competing. And that used to drive me completely insane. It just drove me nuts. So on occasion, I would suggest that maybe if they're interested in competing, they should pay attention to what's going on in their division because it's happening now. And you just might run into one of these people down the road. So that, that was a personal little gripe uh, that I had. And I tried to explain that this would be a very productive thing to do. It's interesting, Jim. If you remember when when I was when you were younger and I was younger, at our at our, at our major tournaments, whether it was a Midwest, the East Coast, or Nationals, we know when the good matchups were coming, and the mats were crowded with with people watching. The Absolutely, the athletes were there watching. You can tell there were three deep. You were in those matches, and so was I. When you look around, and everyone's there watching you. Absolutely. Uh, People were fans of judo. They wanted to see the fight. Right. And again, back to the first call, is that if you have a magazine, you can learn about these people and look forward to watching them too. Uh, but you have to be a fan. I mean, I, I wanted to watch. No one made me watch. I wanted to. I wanted to see it. You know, I, I, I have memories, you know, and I'm sure you do, of matches that were great matches that you were so excited to watch. Absolutely. You know, people aren't fans anymore. And, and, and it's, it's, it's the fault. Our organization has to do a better job of keeping, keeping people interested. I agree. Totally. So I'm going to segue to something, Jim, on this discussion, if you don't mind. Okay. But could I, could well, I ask you one question? Sure. Uh, I'm curious. After you developed this dossier on all of these international players and you retired from coaching, what happened to that document? Well, first thing I did is before I left, I offered all my documents to the, to the next group that came in. Uh, I wanted nothing for it. I was tired. I wanted to go away. Uh, as you know, I was gone for almost 20 years. Yeah. It's your fault I'm back, Jim. My fault. <laughs> Partially. Partially. You'll you have to explain that you one to You me. and Jason. But nonetheless, okay. you know, I offered it to him. I said, listen, I'm, I'm going to take a break. I've got, I don't want anything from you. You know, take, take my stuff. It'll help the next person. And they said, we don't want anything. And I said, well, that's okay. Uh, I gave some of it to the next. Bobby, who coached the 2004 Olympics, I gave a lot of it to him. And uh, I actually don't have much of it left. Unfortunately, unfortunately, but you got to, you know, I printed out every pool sheet from every tournament, you know, four years, I had the pool sheets from the junior tournaments. So I could, I could find any athlete, what they did, who they fought, you know, now you go to judo base and you can find everything, you know? Yeah. They still don't do it, you know? Right. They still don't do it. Even though it's readily accessible. Listen, when I went to Europe, I got a, so a friend of mine to donate a TV, an international TV, that I carried a big box with me with, <laughs> with tapes. I carried it all through Europe. It was no fun getting on and off the trains and getting on the planes. It was crazy, but I had to do it. Yeah. It was a joke, but right. that's what I did. And we, when, you know, when we, weren't, when we weren't training, we were watching videos, and we were, you know, we were still training. So it, it's, it, it, it's a commitment. Uh. So as we're talking about this and being fans, you know, uh, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but in uh, on December 13th, which will be December 12th, our, our time, there is a great judo match coming on. Uh, it's going to be uh, Fumi Abe and Joshiro Mariyama fighting for the 66 kilo spot in the Olympics. I got to tell you, I'm excited about this. I'm excited. I'm going to be up and I'm going to watch it. You know, I sent, I sent the information out to, to the players at my club because no one knew about it. Most people don't know what's, don't know what's going on. This is judo fan, you know, candy. I mean, this is something that everyone should be watching. Can't wait to watch. 
You know, I'm excited about it. It's going to be at, I think, 11 p.m. Chicago time. And as I'm older, Jim, I, I don't stay up as late as I used to, but I'm going to make it a point this time. Uh, this is going to be something to watch. And it's got an hour and a half time limit. So they're going to probably show some backgrounds like the Japanese do for judo. It'll be a great thing to watch. Most people don't know about it. I mean, how, how is it possible? And Rob, here's an idea. When the match is over, we should have a, a little a group of people talk about the fight, show it again. It's only going to be four or five minutes. And we should invite people to talk, call in and bring Jason in and Jim and have a few people in. Let's discuss that that fight, see if people are interested. I mean, that would be a great thing to talk about. I mean, it's, it's the best of the best judo. And whoever's watching this, if you haven't seen either of these guys play, go on YouTube. They are amazing, <laughs> amazing judo players. So, man, it, it, it's something I'm excited about. Uh, yeah, Steve, so, I, I'll tell or, you what, or among coaches. And I'll tell you what, you know, I talk, I'm, I'm, Jason is a good friend of mine, and we talk judo a lot. Jason's a brilliant judo player. He's got a brilliant mind. He's a brilliant tactician. You know, he's a guy you like to hear talk about judo. Uh, I know you're going to have him on uh, in a few days, but he'd be someone to have on here, you know, to discuss that because he's got a great, a, a great view of judo. I think that's an excellent idea. Yeah. So it's, it's something you should do. And you know what? It'll be fun. Yeah. It'll, it'll be fun. It'll be fun to do. There's another uh, uh, contest coming up that, that's not necessarily going to be on TV yet, but I hope they do it on YouTube, is in Canada, they're going to have a fight off for the 57 kilo division. And if you follow judo, you know that the, the Chris, uh, Christine uh, Yama, uh, was it, Deguchi and Jessica Klinkate, two top Canadian players. One is world champion. And Klinkate has been winning major tournaments. That's going to be a great fight to watch. I hope they put it on TV. You know, again, that's exciting. Judo's exciting. Just no, no one, <laughs> no one talks about it. So one of the reasons we need to communicate better, you know, get a magazine and, you know, it's just it's 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 great. It's judo candy for me. <laughs> yeah, it's an excellent idea. Okay. Yeah, I agree about the the lack of a magazine, the lack of a newsletter. Uh, you're on the uh, USJ promotion board. And just the recent changes uh, on, on Facebook, I, I referred people to the news release that was on the website and, and no one was really uh, aware of that. It, it's, it's almost uh, deafening by its silence uh, about information about what's going on and, and the many good changes the, the new promotion board chair has made. Yep, yep, no question, no question. It, it's people, have got to, again, be trained and taught that there's something coming out every month. Yes. You, get, you start getting a magazine every month, people will start looking for it. You start getting calls, where's my magazine? You know, uh, but until we get back there, no one's paying attention, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Does USA Judo uh, send out a uh, document that people Not to my can... knowledge. Not yeah. to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge at all. Um, you know, the, 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 the only... Yes. What yes. do you mean by magazine? <laughs> it speaks volumes. Uh, before we get too far, let's let's get, if you don't mind, move to the other direction. Absolutely. With, you know, where, where do we go from here? Okay. Uh, we have to change the mentality of U.S. Judo. Now, U.S. Judo has a mentality where they want to be, you know... They, they, they want to be the king in a small pond, big fish in a little pond. Everyone wants to protect their own little area and they don't want to move out. They're afraid if it gets too big. And, you know, th th there's reasons for that too. You know, if, you know, Jimmy, you have a guy, an, an average judo player, a guy who does judo, he's not, not really good, but he starts, you know, he likes kids and he starts a club at a YMCA and maybe he's got 10, 12 kids. And those kids walk in and he's the sensei. He's the guy, you know, his knowledge is limited, but he's the guy, you know, when he goes to tournaments or they see other people, all of a sudden he's not as knowledgeable. Usually 
people look down upon that guy and they w- w- would say things derogatory. We got to bring this guy up and say, listen, you're a part of the system. You're bringing people in. We need to embrace those guys and we need to help them. You know, we, we have, have to, to make, make people, people un- unafraid, unafraid that, that if their student goes to another club, that that student's going to be grabbed by another uh, a school. There's, There's got to be some, some honor, you know, with, with, with this. So, so we, we can, can move across clubs freely without worrying. We need, we need to bring the coaches in and help them, not try to steal from them, you know? So, so these guys that, that, that have the ability to bring people in, and sometimes it's, you know, they're making a lot of money. You know, you don't want to take money out of their pocket. You know, sure, if someone wants to join your club and come there five days a week and want to make a change, you talk to their other instructor. Sometimes there's nothing you can do about it, but you do it in an honorable way. And you work together. It's, it's doable. doable. I've done that my whole life. I've never, if someone came to my club from another club, I called the instructor right away. It's just the honorable thing to do. So in 1969, World Championships, Japan won every division, every single division. And the Europeans, when they went home, they said, you know what? We're trying to beat Japan at their game, and we're never going to beat them. We're going to stop traveling to Japan and train with them because they're not going to teach us to beat them. We need to find a way to beat them here. Then we can train with them. But until we can beat them, it doesn't do us any good. So for the next uh, two years to the Olympics, Europeans trained together. They traveled. You know, they had Euro passes. They went from Germany to Austria. They trained all together. You know, no problem. Everyone wanted to be, make Europe the best they can be. And sure enough, in 1972, you know, Europe won three gold medals. Three gold medals, that's a big shift. And slowly you start to see a change, you know, and the Europeans start getting better. And then they get, you know, they have kids in, the, in high school, and you start making the junior team, they give you a Euro pass. And that's your training. There's camps in Italy. There's camps in, 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 in England. There's, There's camps, camps all over Europe. Go there and train. And the coaches help the kids out. They know each other. And they work together as a family. So sure enough, when, when, it, when it comes time to make the Olympic team, you're certainly, you want your country's guy to make it. But if he can't make it, you want another European to make it. Because these are your guys now. That's the way we have to be. We have to have that mentality. We have to put together our clubs. Organization's not going to do it. They don't view things that way. I don't know what they're thinking, with all due respect. No, I, agree. I know that I know that the clubs that want to get it better have got to work together. They have to embrace the smaller clubs and bring them in. And then they have to find a way to work together on a regular basis. So if someone's wants, if someone is, is from Michigan and is a good athlete, they want to come to Chicago once or twice a week for a month to train for the Nationals, come on in. You're welcome. Come on. You know? I mean, Erwin and I always had the mentality. It all ends on that. I don't want to beat you by, by default. If you're better than me, I want the better man to win. That's judo, right? I don't, I don't want to keep a guy away because he may beat me. You know, if I'm not the best, who, you know, we want the best to go. And we should embrace that, be a part of it. So that's a mentality we have to change and we have to start working together. And from there, once that mentality changes, then we say, okay, first thing we have to do is we have to have in-club tournaments. Let's bring our young kids in. Whoever has the big dojos, bring these kids in, bring the coaches in. Let the kids referee make it all fun. And they go out there for two minutes, two minutes, whatever it is, and they fight. You know, it's all a good time. It doesn't matter. Everyone gets a, a reward. Everyone gets something. And it's a good, great experience. And the kids get the fight. And they get more than one match. More than one match. You have five matches. And then you have exhibition matches. Who's, who's there? Let's you and you. Let's go. You know, coach says, I want my kid to get another match. Let's get another match. You know? And when it's all done, everyone had a good time. And you know what? You start making friends. And then the judo becomes a little more social. And it gets easier to do. You know, that, that's, that, 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 that's the starting point. Another thing we have to do is all judo tournaments, not small ones, but all major tournaments, if it's 
my, my nephew's, nephew's tournament, tournament, if it's Jimmy's, Jimmy's tournament, tournament, Jason's tournament, Jason's tournament, all the big tournaments, they, they have, have to be on Saturdays. And there has to be a camp the day after for no cost. So anyone that makes a trip there and has two, three matches can stay and go another 10 rounds around Oregon the next day. Everyone has to do that. That's the way we have to run our tournaments, okay? So, I mean, first of all, you're getting your money's worth now. You know, I have girls that travel all over. If they can get two flights, it's a big deal. Yeah, and that's the tragedy. Now, if they stay for the training camp, there may be 10 boys they can fight in the training camp. You know, we need to have that. We need to have that. We need to have weekend training camps in the regions that everyone's allowed to come. The guys with the big dojos have to host it. Okay? That's, that's, that's what has to be. Okay? And you have a workout on Friday night and two workouts on Saturday, and they can go home. They can go 10 rounds each workout, and they have 30 rounds around Dory on a weekend. 30 rounds around Dory. I did that with my kids. They, 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 they were walking. They have never been so sore in their life. They didn't know what it was like to do 30 rounds. I said, wait, if I send you to Japan, you want to be sore. You don't know what sore is. <laughs> uh, you know, it, this is what we have to do. And every kid that I took, and this is with Paul, I went to Paul's club. Every kid that I took says, when we go, and they're bugging me, when we go back, when we go back. They loved it. Paul's kids loved it. This is what we have to do. Uh, the other thing we have to do. This is, you know, besides tournaments, my nephew, uh, Aaron, my nephew, Aaron and RJ, did something really, really smart that uh, USA Judo or someone should have read it on to, and they missed it. He put together team matches, state against state. So we had a team match against Atlanta. The first one, we went there. Illinois against Atlanta. We put an Illinois team together, went to Atlanta, we fought the, the, the team from Georgia, Leo White was on Facebook, he was doing the announcing, and oh, it was fun watching it. I wasn't there, but I watched it on, on, face, on Facebook. It was great watching that. Uh, God, I can't think of his name, the guy from, uh, from Atlanta. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I apologize, I love the guy. Uh, great coach, great, loves the kids. Uh, and and uh, it just it was a great time. And then after the team match, obviously there was a workout and everyone worked out, had a great time. They did it again next year and we included Ohio. And we had three teams. And we had it in Chicago. It was great. All the kids, they had, they had, they must have had four or five fights in the team match and then we went back the next day and we had a, a camp, a workout. I mean, you gotta do judo, right? Yeah. You can't get good if you're not doing judo. You gotta do a lot of judo. Yeah. You know, so, so, so you, you can't get, uh, you can't make a lot of progress if you're working out with 72 people every day. And, and, and the thing is, too, is that I, I tell people all the time, you know, you teach them a move, and they want to get it tomorrow. I said, listen, there's nothing I can do, no matter how good a teacher I am, that can replace time on the mat. You need to put time on the mat. You'll get better, but you got to be on the mat. You know, I can't, I can't teach you something that just works. You know, you put and I think that's unfortunate. unfortunate. Well, <laughs> I would have loved that. I would too. <laughs> I would too. Uh, it, it takes, takes years, right? It takes years. You gotta be on the mat. Gotta have your feet on the mat. And that's just the reality of it. That's the reality of it. So, you know, I don't know about the other people that are involved in the tournament. You know, I, you know, I, I don't know about, you know, what organization is gonna do this. You know, I'd love for the JA to take this up in a serious way. Uh, where we're, we're looking to do that. Uh, uh, I would love for, you know, for the clubs to get there. You know, the, there is a serious, uh, a serious concern between clubs and small clubs about their students. And there has to be a real hard line on how we work together. We have to work together honorably, you know, and, and, and that's a critical part of it. I think it has to be, uh, I don't know that any of the three organizations are structured or interested enough to have that kind of activity take place. I think it's up to the club leaders to initiate and get together and do it. 
Um, if we wait, I think that American Judo organizationally, even before the pandemic, has become somewhat ineffective in providing services to the club leaders. So I think it's up to the grassroots club leaders to come together and do the things that you're talking about. Well, I'm going to try to do it from my end the best I can, mm -hmm. uh, with the understanding that I'm not interested in traveling that much anymore. Yeah, I've traveled quite a bit in my life, uh, but with that said, you know, I, I'm willing to try to help any way, you know, I can. And we need to understand that a coach's education, not an online course, real judo education. Understanding how to teach, what to look for, you know, how, you know what, when, when, you know what the, the the basics are that kids have to have, you know, to move forward. That teaching these coaches, letting them know, would be a great benefit, a great benefit going forward. Pete, do you have any insight into the current coaching certification system? Does it does it actually do much in a practical way? Or is it more academically oriented? It's it's more it's more academically oriented. There there's always been a split historically whether whether we should demand if uh, a coach going up for certification needs to actually demonstrate the move uh, because some of the coaches are are older and and kind of past their prime. So demonstrating a you know whatever you want to call it, no soda no ceremony is is. Um, uh, they have complained that it's not fair, but but, but they have the knowledge and that they can and I'm and I'm being real candid here um, can mm -hmm. can um, can demonstrate it so if they can explain it then their player should be able to perform it. Well, I, 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 with all due respect, I understand what you're saying, and I'll take a hit for the old guys because I don't move like I used to. But uh, the way you tell if someone's a good coach is by the players he produces. Exactly. Yeah. I don't have. I don't have to show that I can teach it. I'm going to bring a student and show you who I taught. If they can do it, then you know I can teach it. You know. Right. Every time someone kind of comes to me and say, "We're going to go work out over here. We're going to learn from him," I said, "That's fine with me. Name me three players they produced. Just name me three players they produced, and then we can talk." And uh, I, I get this dumb look. Well, uh, I don't know. Okay, so you're going to go someplace to help your kid. And you're going to take them to a coach that never produced an athlete. You know? Is that what you do when you go to a doctor? How many surgeries have you got? Well, not many. Okay, I want to go with you. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Look at the, the people that actually produce, you know, the athletes. A lot of the people that produce the athletes are these unsung heroes that you don't see. You know? It used to be more so maybe 20, 30 years ago. You know, or a guy like Willie Cahill, who I don't know what kind of judo player he was. I really don't know. But he produced some great, great junior athletes. Not good, great. There's something to be said for that. I don't need to see Willie do Osotogari. I don't need to see it. I saw his students do it. His students dominated the tournaments with a good judo. You know, I mean, that's how you tell. I mean, that's the, for me, that's the telling factor. You know, you've got you've got people that have produced really good judo players. There's something there. Maybe that's an old school view, Jim. I don't know, but that's my view. No, I think that's true. And I'm telling you, when 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 as as a when I look at people for 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 their ability, when someone tells me this person, you know, should be this or that rank, I said, can he teach him so early? Does he have someone he's taught? In Osoto Murray. I mean, I mean, it's simple. I mean, you gotta have a basic knowledge if you're gonna be a, a teacher. And we don't do that. We don't do that. I'm happy to teach them, and then they know it. But but it's just you know, people don't know. They don't care to know. And that's a shame. Steve, can you um, give us some insight into methods of recruiting and retaining students. I know that your nephews have a large club that are very skillful at bringing students in and retaining them. And uh, 
The kids seem to have a wonderful time. They enjoy themselves. What are some of the key factors in uh, bringing students in and keeping them engaged? Well, you know, it's always important that when you look to build a judo club, you don't compare yourself with other judo clubs. You compare yourself with the other clubs because that's who your competition is. Down the street is a gymnastics club. Uh, across is a wrestling club. And then you have, you know, hockey. I mean, there's all different sports. So being the best judo club doesn't mean anything because there's no other judo clubs around, right? Doesn't mean anything. <laughs> Where'd you go? Did I, can you see me still? Yeah. Oh, okay. For some reason, I can't see you, but it's okay. I'm going to ruin my, my call. All right. Uh, what you have to do is make judo social for these kids. You want to come and see their friends. So th th there's two, two things. When, when I did it, you know, we had events. We had events that mattered. Build, team building events, but they were events. We had a huge summer picnic. People talked about, you know, we had the black, we had enough black belts to have a softball game with, with, the, with the parents and the uh, lower ranks. So that was a big deal. Big deal, big softball game. Everyone loved it, couldn't get enough of it, and the food was great. It was always important that everybody brought a food from their ethnic background. So we had that, you know, we had the Japanese and the Russian and the Chinese and the, I mean, the Israeli, and it was always fun like that. Uh, we had an awards banquet that was great where kids got awards. And we gave awards for the, the hardest working athlete and the, uh, you know, the toughest athlete. And the kids love that. And they strive to win that. And, and usually the kid that doesn't win a lot, who gets the hardest working athlete, that's something that stays with him for the rest of his life. Uh, and uh, the other thing is that we had a holiday party that we had a talent show in. And the reason we had a talent show is so kids could see another side of the people, the kids that they were banging heads with every night. So one kid plays the piano, one kid sings a song, another kid dances, and all of a sudden you're getting a different view of these kids that makes it, it, makes it better. One of the kids that we had that used to sing is now a Broadway starring producer. I've got videos of him when he's 10 years old singing at our, at our, uh, uh, <clears throat> our talent show, and the guy's a superstar. It, it, it's wonderful. My nephews do things very similar. You know, they have events that people don't miss. They have a Halloween party, and everyone dresses crazy. I don't wear costumes. Everyone's in <laughs> costumes. Everyone's there. They have a summer picnic. That and with the Russians, the drinking starts early. Uh, and then there's a barbecue, the food is incredible. Starts early, it goes late, everyone goes. And the team, the whole club goes to Florida for the US Open. We all stay at the same hotel, we, we work together, we go to the pool together, we eat together. It's a wonderful event, and they don't miss that. And that's a part of the social. Now, of course, the judo's got to be fun and good. But those social events really build, you know, really build the club up. And, and my nephews do that really, really well. You know, so you gotta make it social. You gotta make it fun. You gotta make there a reason, you know, you know, to, to go. Not everyone wins. They gotta have fun. I think that that point um, has been missed. There's been, in my opinion, an overemphasis early in winning, and um, that carries through even as people mature. Uh, this winning, emphasis on winning, um, I think is somewhat misstated because there's a lot that's missed on the way to winning. The camaraderie, bringing them in, learning the techniques, becoming a technician having a, a good kata demonstration, doing the actual judo. You have to have fun. You have to enjoy what you're doing. And if you enjoy it, then you can put in the time and effort to win. Does that make any sense? 
No, no Jim, it, 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 it goes one step further. For me, as someone who develops athletes, mm -hmm. the kids that win early, I can't keep because, because when they get hard, they leave. Right, right. exactly. They to win. win. They, when they start winning later on, they're used to struggling and fighting hard. Winning early, I mean, winning early is, is, is good to keep the kids in the game because winning is fun. Yeah. But the truth is, for you know, I've got a small handful of kids that won early and stayed with it. But all those kids had a real good work ethic and never lost. Most kids that win early don't like to lose. And once they start losing, because in judo, you're going to lose. That's a guarantee. You're going to lose. You know, I mean, it's hard to, you know, it's hard when you're winning all the time. Losing is not fun. Right. So it, 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 there's a lot of reason for that. And again, it's all about... You gotta be a professional as a coach. If a kid's doing a move wrong and he's winning with it, you gotta change it. Right. I, I had a situation with a kid who was was actually very good. And uh, when he was ten years old, he was winning every national. He had a good and, and he was grabbing the head and trying to do Uchimata, and Uchimata was off. The kid never lost. So I changed because Uchimata had to be right. And the first nationals he lost and his mother came and he says, What are you doing? I said, I'm doing what I know is right. You know, you're worried about winning. I don't care if he wins. He's got to learn, you know, how to do the moves correctly. And sure enough, not too long after that, once he got it, because he was a great athlete, he started throwing people, and it was a, a big change for the better. You know, I mean, if you're, if you're in math and you're doing the problem wrong, even if you're getting the right answer, you got to stop it and change it. There's no difference here, because at some point, at some point, it's not going to work. Yeah. yeah, and that's important. Without question. Yeah. Well, we don't have uh, a lot of questions showing up, and we are approaching our time. In conclusion, Steve, do you have any uh, last words that you'd like to impart to the audience? Well, I think that, you know, whoever watches this video should understand that right now, with U.S. Judo during this pandemic, we are in a situation that if we don't find a way to work together, it's going to be difficult to move forward. That's my humble opinion, but that's the way I see it. Uh, as I said, I don't see Judo being bigger once the pandemic ends. I see it being tougher. You know, We're gonna deal with the school sports and the other sports that have a better marketing plan. You know, the clubs have got to work together. We have to share ideas. We got to share coaches, share knowledge, you know, and make it fun for the kids. And, and it's more important now than ever. You know, it's more important now than ever. So hopefully, you know, that the, the coaches and the club owners, you know, can get together and work together to, 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 to try to build Judo back up. That's my hope. Well, thank you, Steve. I think you're right. We're in a crater, and it's going to be a long slog coming up out of the Grand Canyon. Um, I like your idea of watching uh, the YouTube of this fabulous match that's coming up, and we will put on the agenda a discussion group with you and Jason and show the match, and I think that would uh, be very enlightening for the audience. So thank you very, very much for your presentation and your key ideas on building judo and watching judo as a fun sport. My pleasure, Jim. Thank you. Enjoy your evening, gentlemen.